Hi, my name is Dr. Jim Lynch. I'm a physician outside of Washington, D.C., and I'm looking forward to sharing my experiences over the next 15 minutes or so with a procedure that I've been using called stellate ganglion block to treat PTSD for about the past 10 years in the United States. Uh, I'll go through a few slides here and try to boil down the pertinent top pertinent points of the topic here. It's a difficult thing to condense into 15 minutes, but I'll try to hit the high points. So uh, what I plan to talk about is just describe basically what is stellate ganglion block, which is it, it is a procedure like I've already said. I'll describe that a little bit. Talk about the neuroscience behind the stellate ganglion block and how it fits into post-traumatic stress disorder. And then talk about the published evidence uh, now that there's about 18 articles published in the peer-reviewed medical literature and just kind of summarize where that stands. Um, really what I'm hoping to share though, more than that is, is really my experiences in using stellate ganglion block in collaboration with my behavioral health colleagues and trauma-focused psychotherapy to achieve really superior outcomes. So just to give you the bottom line up front, what I hope the takeaways will be from this talk, if you, if you uh, miss the rest and can catch this, um, this is the important stuff. So the, the bottom line up front, the stellate ganglion block is a procedure, procedure that's been around for a long time. It's simply an injection of local anesthetic into the neck, into a nerve in the neck. The bottom line on uh, overall success for PTSD treatments is there's about a 50% reduction in symptoms um, for greater than 80% of patients. The stellate ganglion block works immediately. So as in within hours, um, not days to weeks, there's a noticeable difference within hours. It rapidly improves uh, several several things, many, many symptoms in PTSD, but really where the, the major focuses and the major improvements come from cluster D and E in terms of the DSM-5 criteria for stellate ganglion block, and that's cognition and mood, and then really the arousal and reactivity symptoms of PTSD are, are quite, uh, quite pronounced in their success. Stellate ganglion block is not a uh, um, cure all by itself. It's not to be used as a, a treatment alone. Um, it does help quite a bit to mitigate hyperarousal symptoms, which are independent predictors of poor response to PTSD. So it seems to me a no brainer that we would engage um, an adjunct to psychotherapy that can help improve uh, success. So really, where, where does this all come from? The, the way stellate ganglion block was discovered to be useful in PTSD was a bit of an accident. Um, however, we've spent a good deal of the past 10 years trying to dial back the science to actually have a rational um, explanation for this. So the best place to start really is with fMRI or functional MRI data from PTSD uh, patients. And we see that there are uh, historically some specific areas in the brain that light up um, or are affected by PTSD pretty, pretty distinctly and pretty, um, pretty repeatedly. And that's really the amygdala and hippocampus, as well as some areas in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, many of you know this. And what, what the connection then is with the stellate ganglion block, we'll, we'll work backwards from that. Um, so these are the areas within the brain. Um, as you know, or many of you know, um, what exactly goes on in terms of brain architecture and chemistry in terms of post-traumatic stress is still a bit unknown. And um, while we have uh, targeted therapies for some, um, some of the areas, what, what we're still discovering is where can we leverage um, other targets that can be effective for post-traumatic stress symptoms. So without getting into all the details on this slide, um, I, many of you are familiar with this and some are not uh, familiar with the central autonomic dysfunction theory of, of how the autonomic nervous system works within the brain. Um, but the, the, um, the wave tops view of presenting this really is that there's not one specific area in the brain that uh, regulates the body's autonomic nervous system. By autonomic nervous system, again, I mean the body's fight or flight system. So the, the fight or flight, the sympathetic nervous system portion of the autonomic nervous system um, lives in several areas of the brain and specifically in the salience network, which is highlighted here at the top, is one of the parts of the central autonomic nervous system. And we can see here that this is also, also correlates with the areas that light up on, a, on an abnormal PTSD functional MRI scan. 
So what, what we call is if the salience network is dysfunctional and not working well, it really interferes with the, the brain's ability to process um, the, the things that are normally done on autopilot. So the central executive network and default mode networks become disturbed and that, that's part of the problem. Um, so, so again, uh, the difficulty comes in targeting these areas within the brain. Um, but what the Stelly ganglion block does, it allows us to step outside the brain into an area in the neck, which is what connects the brain to the body, and to look for uh, a target there where we can intervene in the dysfunctional central autonomic problem. So this is not a new concept. The stellate ganglion block has been around for 100 years, and it's been used historically to treat many sympathetically mediated problems. So this is, this is really a, 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 a foot stomp part of this talk is, is that this is not a new concept. This is not some um, fringe voodoo medicine or something like that. This is really just applying a tried and true procedure to a different indication. Um, there was a wonderful book written here by Daniel Moore back in the 50s that describes the stellar ganglion block. And I'd like to highlight this point here. So we described just a second ago that there is a part, portions of the brain that are the really the originator or terminator of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, but what, what Moore describes in his book is this um, elegant term here describing the cervical sympathetic trunk, which runs in the neck, is an anatomic funnel through which all sympathetic fibers must flow on their way to the head, neck, and thorax. This to me is the key to understanding why stellar ganglion block works. So the block's been around, like I said, for 100 years, been used to treat many, many different things over the years. Presently, it's used to treat pain syndromes of the upper extremity, such as complex regional pain syndrome, or CRIPS, previously known as reflex sympathetic dystrophy, or things like zoster, postherpetic pain, or phantom limb pain in the upper limb. Um, these are still indications for stellate ganglion block, which is used you know, daily around the world to treat these pain syndromes. Um, what it is, is the, the stellate ganglion block is simply that. It's a nerve block using a long-acting long acting local anesthetic. In our case, we use ropivacaine, about seven milliliters, to, to inject in an area in the neck along the cervical sympathetic trunk to block the nerve, just like you would do if you were blocking a peripheral nerve for a procedure like to give stitches or sutures or to pull a toenail or something like that. It's the same concept. We're going to block a nerve. In this case, the nerve is the nerve that controls the body's fight or flight syndrome fight or flight system, as opposed to one that regulates pain. So again, pulling from Moore's book, I think these, the, these plates are just beautiful. I wanted to include them here, but these are uh, cadaveric dissection drawings that shows all the anatomic variations in the neck. And this to orient you is these chains on either side of the neck are the cervical sympathetic trunk or cervical sympathetic chain. And this cluster of nerves down at the base is called the stellate ganglion. There's one on each side. And that is the target for us to numb the, the cervical sympathetic trunk because it has connections into those areas of the brain, as previously mentioned, like the amygdala and the hippocampus, where PTSD seems to uh, take hold. This is the same drawing on ultrasound. I won't go through all the anatomic markings. But the point is, now that we have the technology that allows us to see beautiful anatomy within the neck. And we can safely and very precisely deliver local anesthesia through a needle into the area where the cervical sympathetic trunk lies, which is this muscle called longus coli. Again, this is a, a difficult procedure, but one that's very safe when done, when performed by a, a physician who's experienced in it. The bony landmark is here, the C6 vertebrae, and then in avoiding critical structures like the internal jugular vein and the carotid artery, we can deliver the medicine directly into where the cervical trunk is. The procedure is uh, performed with a patient lying wide awake on their back. It can be done as an outpatient procedure, and believe it or not, it only takes a few minutes. Um, this is not some dramatic procedure that requires hospitalization and certainly does not require sedation or anything like that. Most patients are observed for about 20 to 30 minutes afterwards and then are free to go home and um, will notice uh, effects immediately after. It's a very safe procedure. Like I said, it's been done for 100, 100 years. Um, most of that time it was done as a blind injection without any image guidance at all. And, and even then was done quite safely. You can imagine now that the safety profile is significantly better in using ultrasound.
But still, anytime you place a needle in the skin, there's always the risks of pain, bleeding, or infection. Um, there can be a vasovagal response where someone may feel lightheaded, um, but the patient's already laying down on their back and it usually subsides spontaneously. There could be a retropharyngeal hematoma anytime a needle is placed into the neck like that. And then really the one thing that we're concerned about most, I think, when I perform the procedure is an inadvertent intravascular injection. Um, if we were to inject uh, local anesthetic into a vessel that went to the brain, it could cause a seizure. Um, to mitigate this risk, we spend a good deal of time looking at the vascular structures and ultrasound, which is why I favor ultrasound over fluoroscopy. You can see vessels quite clearly and very safely inject the medicine, but again, it is a potential risk. The picture here on the screen shows Horner syndrome. Now, this is not a, a risk or a, a, a side effect per se. It's actually an anticipated and an, and an expected response. When the cervical trunk is blocked, the uh, the stellate ganglion block is deemed effective when it when it causes this effect. So in this case, the block was done on the right hand side, and this eye is showing you that the stellate ganglion block worked. It causes meiosis and ptosis, so a lid drooping, a pinpoint pupil, and a red sclera or a red eye. These are indications that the block has worked, and that is usually where often about six hours by the time the uh, rapivacaine wears off. A brief history on SGB for PTSD. It was described first by Leibovitz and all back in 1990. And that case, uh, case report really lay dormant and kind of obscure in the literature for many years until a doctor in Chicago named Eugene Lipov began describing his experiences with uh, SGB for PTSD when he noted some of his patients with PTSD that were receiving a stellate ganglion block for pain actually noted improved symptoms in their PTSD. Shortly thereafter, he shared his experiences with Dr. Sean Mulvaney and I, who were both U.S. Army physicians at the time. And uh, among uh, a few of our colleagues and Dr. Mulvaney and I, we really took, uh, took this initiative to make this rooted in the U.S. Army's treatment for PTSD. And we published uh, several articles along the way. One of the, the larger ones that was kind of a game changer was a case series of 166 of our patients from the special operations communities uh, in the US military where there was a dramatic effect. Um, and it really got the attention of a lot of military providers and began at still a ganglion block began to work its way into um, US military standards of care for PTSD. Um, again, it is, this is not a fully accepted part of the clinical practice guideline for P PTSD in the United States. Um, and for several years, we've been uh, pushing the rock towards that tipping point, but, but we're not exactly there yet. Last year, there was a large multi-center uh, randomized clinical trial that was conducted in, the, in U.S. Army facilities um, that highlighted the evidence for stellar ganglion block being twice as effective as a sham procedure. And I'll highlight that on the next slide. We thought that that would really be a tipping point. And again, um, I think that the tide hasn't turned completely, but we're certainly mounting evidence um, to uh, garner stellar ganglion block as an adjunct to other psychotherapy procedures. There's 18 uh, studies now published in the literature. Again, this, is, this was really the large randomized clinical trial with an N of 113. Um, that showed that the mean improvement using the metric of the CAPS-5 score really showed twice the effect of a sham injection. The sham injection was just simply lidocaine placed in the superficial muscles, but the, the patients or the subjects in the study didn't know whether it was an actual injection um, or a sham injection. So another question that comes up in the literature is which symptoms um, of PTSD are, are most effective or most improved? Um, as you know, PTSD is an extremely heterogeneous procedure, um, and there, there are symptoms all over the place in terms of how each individual is affected. So we, we published a study here several years ago looking at which specific items on the PCL form were changed both, at, both between baseline to one week after stellate ganglion block, and then followed out two to four months. So what you see here is it's a little difficult to uh, understand all at once, but here you see uh, green being that the, the conditions were not affected at all, red being extremely affected. And at baseline, there are certain items, if you look down here at the bottom of the 17 item scale, there are certain items that were really uh, affected with very high scores that then became very um, reduced after still a ganglion block. 
So it gave us an idea of which specific symptoms. And as we drill down on those, we found that these, these symptoms are particularly affected, these hyperarousal symptoms, really irritability, angry outbursts, difficulty concentrating, and difficulty falling or staying asleep. And these make sense when we talk about the science behind uh, blocking the sympathetic nervous system and dialing down the fight or flight system, something that's been elevated inappropriately for, for years and years for many people. We've had experience now among many uh, psychologists and psychiatrists who have used still a gangling block, primarily that are aff affiliated with the US military. So a, a study we published last year was to try to take their impressions and opinions of still a gangling block and share them with the, the rest of the um, the rest of the clinical society through a published, published study. Really the big take home point from this was, was of behavioral health clinicians who have experience with steli ganglion block, 95% of them would recommend steli ganglion block to another psychologist or psychiatrist caring for PTSD patients. And this graphic from the study in particular highlighted the fact that if you look here at the bottom, um, None, so steli ganglion block is here right at the top, but at the bottom here, you look at harmful or not helpful, and none of the respondents thought that steli ganglion block was harmful or not helpful. All of them felt that steli ganglion block had at least some, was at least somewhat helpful, if not very beneficial. And listed below here are all of the other treatments that are part of the standard US DOD or Department of Defense and Veterans Affairs clinical practice guideline for PTSD. Some of them that are quite well known will see that some of the providers thought were, were at times not helpful or potentially even harmful. So this was a very important study for us. This is again, a very small study. It's a biased sample in that it comes from providers who are already using steli ganglion block, but it, it also uh, highlights the importance of getting the word out so that people can, can see these are the experiences of, of our most experienced clinicians uh, with steli ganglion block. So this is really a, a wave top look. I, I will refer you to the Steli Institute website for further information. But just in summary, steli ganglion block has been used, uh, again, as a procedure, it's been around for 100 years. For PTSD, it's been around for 10 years, and it's been used in thousands of trauma survivors extremely successfully to reduce symptoms by 50% immediately. The duration of effect can be weeks to months to years. There's a lot of variability in there, but average is somewhere around six months to a year of really good relief of symptoms. Uh, Steli ganglion block is effective at reducing dysfunctional sympathetic tone. It has a rapid onset again immediately, provides durable relief, like I said, in weeks to months to years. It's very accepted by patients and many people are much more willing to have a procedure with a needle in the neck that lasts only a few minutes and is relatively painless rather than take a medication every day. So that's another thing to consider. And it's very safe when performed by an experienced physician. Most importantly, steli ganglion block is not a silver bullet or a standalone uh, treatment, but it, it, it does not replace any other treatments, but it, it enhances traditional standard trauma-focused uh, psychotherapy. And that's really the, the take home message here. Those of you who are treating patients with PTSD should at least consider adding steli ganglion block to your already existing treatment regimens. Uh, I hope that at least gives a wave tops. Again, this is my email and my contact information. And a thank you to my partner, Dr. Sean Mulvaney, who's been a pioneer in steli ganglion block for many, many years. Um, for further information, you can check out the steliinstitute.com website, and there's plenty of information left on that. Thank you very much.